false prophets to a contest to see who had what God had the power to demonstrate His existence. You know, the same thing needs to happen today. We're going to talk about that and show you how you can do that. Stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry emphasizing God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I'm continuing a series on Elijah. We've, we're learning lessons from the life of Elijah. And uh, today's the end of my second week of teaching on this. And I tell you, we've covered some wonderful, wonderful truths. We've been talking about the drought that Elijah prophesied. And you know, the whole time I've been talking about drought, it's raining, <laughs> torrential rain right here. You might be able to hear it over my television program, but uh, we've been talking about this. And I'm now in 1 Kings chapter 18, where after three and a half years of drought, the Lord told Elijah to come back and reveal himself unto Ahab. And Elijah came back and basically took control. Here's Ahab, a king who had outlawed the worship of God and who had been killing the prophets of God. And Elijah was a prophet of God that prophesied to him and said there was going to be a drought. So Ahab was mad at him and said, Are you the one that's troubling Israel? And Elijah turned it right back around. It's not me. You're the one that brought all of this upon yourself. And then Elijah took control and told the king what to do. He says, gather all of Israel together to me tomorrow at Mount Carmel, and we're going to have a showdown. And, you know, the amazing thing is Ahab obeyed Elijah. Elijah became more powerful than the king. And you know why? Because he was operating in the supernatural power of God. Today, the church has not operated in the supernatural power of God. As a whole, they have discounted that. Even those who believe that it's available don't understand how to use the power of God. They think that it's just up to petitioning God and waiting on God to do it. They don't understand that they've been given the authority and power. So overall, there's very few people who are truly operating in the supernatural power of God, and as a result, the unbelievers don't respect us. They blow it off. They just think that we're uh, saying words that have no meaning. Jesus had to use the supernatural power of God to validate his message, and we need it today. So that's how Elijah gained this position and this influence. And so it says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20, So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the people together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You know, I like this attitude of Elijah. Elijah knew who the true God was. He knew that there was only one God and that every other religion's claim to a God was not a true God. It was demon worship. It was deception that there was nothing to it. And he knew that he had the power. He goes on later in this instance to say that he had done these things at the Lord's instruction. So the Lord's the one that told him this approach and told him what to do. But he basically was coming to the people and, he, you know, the true worship of God was outlawed at that time, and they had instituted Baal worship, and he basically came and challenged the whole system and said, let's find out who the real God is. Let's put them to a test. Let's see which God can do anything and manifest some supernatural power. I like that attitude. And you know, today, anybody who believes in the Bible has to be aware of the supernatural claims of the gospel. Man, the Lord said that the same works that he did, we would do also in John 14, 12. And he went out and healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, raised the dead. He gave us a command to do the same thing in Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 9. The true gospel is supernatural. And if it isn't supernatural, it's superficial. And there's a lot of people today who claim to be representing the gospel who don't see any power, they actually preach against this and preach that you're of the devil if you believe that God can do miracles today. And I tell you, because of this, the world, the non-believers, 
are laughing and thinking that all it is is just empty words. We have this supernatural power of God at our disposal and we should be using it. And I like this attitude of Elijah. Here's another point that I want to make, and this is very, very, very important. The nation of Israel had been banned uh, from worshiping the true God, and the true preachers of the true God of Israel had been killed, most of them. And so you would definitely say that this was a terrible time in Israel's history. They needed a revival. How did Elijah bring revival? He brought the greatest revival that had ever taken place in the nation of Israel up until that time. How did he do it? Well, in stark contrast to the way people are trying to bring revival today, he didn't petition God and beg God and ask God to do something, but instead he was in communion with God. God gave him a word, and he went out and acted on that word and released the supernatural power of God. As we'll read here in just a moment, the fire from God fell in the sight of all of the people, and instantly the people fell down and said, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. And the people turned to God by the thousands, tens of thousands. How? Because there was somebody who was acting and releasing the power of God. Now, I am all for revival. I believe that America and the entire world needs a revival. We need people to be red hot for God and following God and seeking after God. But the way it's going to happen isn't by another million people getting together and praying and asking God to do it. The Lord has given His power to us, told us that as we go preach the gospel, these signs would follow them that believe. And if we would operate in the supernatural power of God and, re and manifest that power to unbelievers, we would have all of the revival we could handle. You go raise somebody from the dead, and I guarantee you, you will have revival. People will want to come and get what you've got. I think that's important. I think that so much of what is being done in the body of Christ today may be motivated by a good heart. They want to see the right things, but they're trying to go about it in a totally wrong way. And I'm telling you, praying for revival and asking God to send it as if it's his fault, and if he just wanted to, he could, he could pour out his spirit and people would just be seeking God and making God responsible for the apathy and the apostasy that's in all of the nations today, making God responsible, it's his fault, and would you change it? That's wrong. God wants revival more than any of us want it. The reason we aren't experiencing more revival is because we aren't releasing the supernatural power of God. God told us to go preach the gospel and through the foolishness of preaching, people would be saved. Instead, people today are wanting to pray and ask God to just save people and they wouldn't share with anybody for anything because somebody might criticize them. Somebody might roll their eyes at them and that would just be more than they could bear. I tell you what, that is super immature and it's not producing the right results. I like this attitude of Elijah. Let's have a contest. Make a decision. You know what? If you aren't going to serve God, then serve Baal with all of your heart. And if you aren't going to serve Baal, then serve God. Get off the fence. Make a decision. I know that there's people watching this program right now that I don't even know why you're watching this program. You just flip through and for whatever reason you've stopped and you're listening and you're considering it, you're thinking about it, but you wouldn't consider yourself a committed follower of Christ. You aren't totally against it, but you aren't totally for it. I'd say the same thing to you that Elijah said to these people thousands of years ago. How long are you going to halt between two opinions? If there is a God, and if Jesus is the Son of God, and if the things written about Him are true, which I testify that they're true, and He loved you so much that He died for your sins, and then He had the power to raise, rise from the dead and release that life into you and promise you an abundant life. If those things be true, then nothing else really matters. That ought to be priority. First thing in your life is to receive that and to get right with God and start walking in this. And if what I'm saying isn't true, well, then you ought to totally reject it and forget it. But how long are you going to halt between two opinions? Make a decision. Get in or out. Get off of the fence. That's what Elijah was saying to these people. And the people couldn't answer him a word because you know what? They knew it was true. They knew that they needed to get in or out. And so Elijah proposed a test. Look at this in verse 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, 
I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, as I already read on our program yesterday out of 1 Kings 18, 13, Elijah wasn't accurate in what he was saying right here. He had been told that there were still a hundred prophets of the Lord that remained and then had been hidden in a cave. But they weren't bold. They weren't stepping out. And so Elijah felt like, well, they may have some faith, but you know what? They aren't true prophets. They aren't in my class. And he basically misrepresented this. And later on, somebody... Now, here, there's two things you can get out of this. One of them is that even though Elijah was wrong in this respect, and it's proven in this very chapter that he was wrong in what he said, God still used him in such a powerful way that fire came out of heaven and there was a great revival and miracles happened. So that tells us that you don't have to be perfect for God to use you. God has never had anybody qualified working for him yet. So that's one encouraging thing. But does that mean that we can just indulge these things that are wrong and it doesn't matter? No, in the 19th chapter, you're going to find out that his misrepresentation of things and his arrogance about thinking he's the only one that was serving God, that contributed big time to his downfall. And it cost Elijah a lot. And it cost other people their lives because of this misconception. So even though God can use us in spite of the problems in our life, we need to yield ourselves to God and let God get rid of these wrong attitudes and things because they will come back to haunt us. And you can learn that lesson from Elijah. But this is a powerful deal. He's basically challenging the prophets of Baal to a duel. Put up or shut up. If you have any power, well, then let's see it. And I tell you, I like that attitude. Is God calling you to Karis Bible College? When Jimmy first mentioned coming to CBC, I told him he was out of his mind. I haven't always been a very obedient child. I said, Lord, you know, I just can't imagine myself doing anything else. And I said, well, I'd like to expand my vision. My spirit said, uh, you need what he's got. I remember when I filled out the application that I had, I just had such a strong passion that I said, man, I'm ready to move tomorrow. I am coming to school, absolutely. I just know I'm here because the Lord called me here. It took me a long time, but I finally came around that way. You've got to imagine yourself doing something else. Go to our website at www.awme.net and click on the Bible College link or call our helpline at 01922-473-300. We hope to hear from you today. And now, Gospel Truth continues. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, we read, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and call ye on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God." And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. You know, basically what Elijah is saying is, you know, anybody can say that they worship this God and that this God exists, and they can say that they're representing Him. But let's get some proof. You know, put up or shut up. Can your God do anything? And you know what? I like that attitude because, again, the true God of the Bible... The Lord Jesus and His Father, man, the prophets in the Old Testament had supernatural power, such as Moses, such as Elijah, such as Elisha and other people. In the New Testament, Jesus operated in the supernatural power of God and pointed to those miracles saying, this proves that what I'm saying is true. And the followers of Jesus went out and did the same works that Jesus did. There are so many things. Even the apostle Paul, in the Corinthian church, people had come in to say that Paul's preaching was all wrong and that uh, he wasn't representing God correctly and people had started following Apollos and Cephas and all of these and there was division and that's the reason that Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. And he began to start giving theological reasons why they should submit to what he was saying. And finally, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I believe it's around verse 20, 
He just basically came to this point after he had made all of these other truths and theological positions. He says, when I come unto you, I'm not going to know the speech of them which are puffed up, which is an old English way of saying those who are operating in pride and causing this strife. He says, but I'll know the power because the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power and demonstration of the Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So basically, Paul was saying, you know what, when I come, we're going to solve this issue by just seeing who it is that is flowing in the power of God. If you don't have any demonstration of God's power in your life, then you're going to have to shut up and listen to the man who can demonstrate the power of God. <laughs> I like that. I think that's awesome. If we were to apply that same standard to Christianity today, there's a lot of people that would just have to shut their mouth because they don't have any demonstration of the power of God. You know, I've witnessed to some of the cults before that have come and knocked on my door, and I've tried to reason with them from Scripture, but they have their Scriptures that they twist, and they think I'm twisting. And basically, what I do is just begin to start talking to them about, you know what, do you ever see the supernatural power of God? Have you ever seen somebody raised from the dead? I've seen people raised from the dead. Have you seen blind eyes open? I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen deaf ears open. And you know what, when I start talking about the power of God in demonstration, all of these cults have to just shut their mouth because they may have an argument and they may be skilled at debate, but they don't have any power. They don't have any demonstration. You know, I remember when I first got started seeking the Lord, I was still in the Baptist church at this time, and we went and held a meeting in Portales, New Mexico. And the people from the Baptist Student Union, uh, a, a group that was at the college, uh, they asked us to come speak. And this friend of mine, Steve Mock, and I went over there and spoke, and we thought it was going to be... They, they wanted to hear from us. It turned out that they disliked us because we were talking about power and seeing things happen. And they came against us and started slamming us and slandering us and saying we were of the devil. And back then, we didn't pray for the sick. We hadn't gotten that far. We were encouraging that it was possible, but we weren't to that point. But we were at least out witnessing and telling people about the Lord. And these people believe that you didn't ever tell anybody, that you just ought to let your light shine. And uh, they were criticizing us over everything. They said that miracles don't happen today. They said that when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, it was mistranslated. It should have been the Reed Sea, and that the water was only six inches deep. And Steve, the guy that was with me, boy, God gave him supernatural wisdom. It's the first time we had ever heard it. And they were saying, see, miracles don't happen. That didn't happen in the Bible. This was only six inches of water. And Steve said, well, praise God. It's a greater miracle than I thought. And everybody responded by, what do you mean? He says, well, it's amazing that all of those horses and people could drown in six inches of water. <laughs> I thought that was great. But they got to yelling at us. And I mean, there could have been some physical harm. And finally, you know what we did? We just stood up and said, look, you're claiming that your system is better, but we are the ones that are out talking to people and witnessing, and we've seen people born again this week. And so we said, if you have seen a person led to the Lord and born again this week, then you can stand and ask another question. And if you haven't, then we command you to shut up and sit down in the name of the Lord. Do you know what? There wasn't a single person who was critical of us who was out witnessing and hadn't seen anybody born again. And so we just picked up our Bibles and walked right out through the midst of it. In a sense, that's what uh, Elijah's doing. They were saying that they were representing the true God. The true God was Baal. He says, let's have a contest. Let's see some demonstration. And when he brought forth this challenge, it didn't say that the prophets were excited about this. It says the people said, it is well said. Here's another point, another lesson from Elijah. You know what? I believe that the people, the rank and file members in the body of Christ are ready for some power and demonstration of the Spirit. And they want to see who has the power, who can really see the anointing of God manifest. I don't think that it's the people in the pews that have problems with this. But you know where the resistance comes from is from preachers because it's convenient for preachers not to preach that it's God's will to heal and deliver and prosper and abundant life. It's convenient to preach that, oh, we're all going to suffer and just roll with the punches and God's making you better through all this suffering. Because you know what? That, 
You don't have to put up or shut up. You can guarantee that people will have problems. Sickness will come. People will die. And if you're just preaching all of that, you know what? You can get what you preach and nobody can challenge you. But when you start preaching that it's God's will, that puts you on the spot because you're the representative of God. And if you don't see these manifestations of God's power, then all of a sudden it could be embarrassing to you. It could cause people to wonder whether you are a true representative of God. It's preachers that resist this more than it is the rank and file members of the body of Christ. The people said, it is well spoken. And so in verse 25, it says, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you out one bullock for yourselves and dress it first for you or many and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered, and they leaped upon the altar which was made. I believe that the significance of this was they were asking fire to fall, but in a sense, they were upping the ante. They were making it more worth Baal's time because they would jump on the altar and wait for fire to fall, and it wouldn't only consume an animal, but it would consume one of these prophets. They were willing to offer themselves and call on Baal to do this. Boy, there's a great lesson in that. You know, there is so many things. This is so typical. I, I could spend an hour on each one of these points. Let me just point this out real quickly, that this is the way that false religion always is. The sacrifice isn't enough, but they have to add to it by making sacrifices themselves, offering themselves, making deals with God. And you know what? There's people today who call themselves Christians that are just like this. They don't believe that the sacrifice of Jesus purchased them right standing with God. They're going to promise God, oh God, if you'll heal this person, I promise you, I'm going to start going to church. I'm going to do this. I, they're leaping on the altar and saying, here, I'll sacrifice myself. I'll make this promise. I'll quit this. I'll never do this again. They aren't going to God directly through Jesus, but they believe that they have to add to the sacrifice to make it more worthy, more worth God's time. Well, that's a powerful truth. There's people watching this program right now that you may not have realized it before, but you know what? You haven't been trusting Jesus. You've been begging God and making promises and commitments and all of these things. I'm telling you, that's not true Christianity. That's a pagan way of approaching God, offering yourself. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing except faith in what Jesus has done equals everything. The moment you try and improve upon, add to what Jesus has done, you have just polluted the offering of Jesus. And that's what these prophets of Baal were doing. They were leaping upon the altar which was made. And you know what? Elijah's reaction to this is awesome. He begins to mock them. Elijah did something that was com uh, completely politically incorrect. He began to literally ridicule these prophets of Baal to show them to be nothing. You know, today, people would be criticized for doing this. I can say something against some group and say that it's a cult. Now, this isn't the focus. It's not a main thing. I don't just spend my time attacking people. I don't believe that anybody's called to do that. But there is a place to say something is right and something is wrong. But you know what? In our society today, even preachers are afraid to speak out and say that something is good and something is bad because our society has totally inverted everything to where they call good bad and bad good, and nobody can be absolute about anything. Everything is relative. I'm telling you, that's wrong. And there is a place to stand up and point out the error and make it obvious. That's what Elijah did. You know, I'm out of time today, but I will continue this on my programs next week. And so I encourage you to join me then. And also, I really encourage you to get these teachings that we're offering on lessons from Elijah. If you'll listen, our announcer is going to give you some information about how you can get that. And please take advantage of these materials and then join me again next week as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's complete teaching titled Lessons from Elijah is available in a five-part album on tape or CD. It's also available in a DVD album recorded from television. 
Request album T1026 when you send a gift of 16 pounds or more to Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe. Be sure to specify tape, CD, or DVD album when you write or call. The third individual teaching in this album is also available on tape or CD. We suggest a donation of three pounds. But for those unable to give, Andrew and his partners will provide this third teaching free of charge. All you need to do is request teaching TCS03 titled Holy Fire when you write or call and we'll be pleased to send it to you. Make your check payable to AWME. That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Or you can use credit card to place an order by telephone. Our telephone number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. I know that many of you are getting great truths out of these scriptures that we're reading. You're seeing things that you haven't seen before and you're realizing that there's much, much more in the Word of God than what you've gotten out of it. You know, that's the reason that we started our Caris Bible Colleges is to instruct people. The Word of God has your answer. Whatever your question is, the Word has the answer. But you need to get into the Word of God and that's what our Bible Colleges are all about. We not only have the school here in Colorado Springs, but we have four other schools, soon to be six other schools in the United States, four other international schools plus distance learning. So please call the number that you see on your screen and inquire about our Caris Bible Colleges. We recently aired a series of programs documenting Andrew's February visit to Uganda. A year before he arrived, CBC graduate Leland Shores had set up a network of 16 discipleship training centers for 800 local pastors who in turn taught the same lessons to 64,000 parishioners each week. Andrew visited some of these outposts and was deeply moved to see the power of the Word changing so many lives. In the process, he discovered that Leland traveled long hours over dangerous roads in a small Suzuki to accomplish this powerful outreach. When the programs aired around the world, many viewers called to see what they could do to help. We're happy to report that as a result, Leland now has been given the funds to purchase a land cruiser made for the difficult roads of Africa. This vehicle will help him continue to grow this ministry in the days ahead, and we look forward to more good reports to come. In his excitement, he sent us this picture of the car, and he sends his heartfelt thanks to you for your love and generosity. Be sure to tune in Monday for more Gospel Truth.